Hello, and welcome back to Rewildology, the nature podcast that explores conservation, travel, and rewilding the planet. I'm your host, Brooke Mitchell Norman, conservation biologist and adventure traveler. When you think of the high Arctic, what images come to mind? Maybe you envision polar bears, Arctic fox, northern lights, and ice as far as the eye can see. Maybe you see indigenous Inuit communities that specialize in living in these tough environments. Or perhaps your mind is flooded with negative headlines. The Arctic is melting, polar bears are starving to death, people are losing their livelihoods, and on and on. If given the chance, would you sit down with an expert that visits these areas and ask them what's unfolding? Well, today's your lucky day because I have just that guest for you. In this episode, we're sitting down with Jenny Wong, a high Arctic adventure wildlife photographer. Jenny's story is one of strength and challenge. She comes from a line of brave refugees that escaped from China to Vietnam and then eventually settled in Canada, where Jenny was born and raised. In school, Jenny found her passion in chemistry and biology back when her camera was only used as a paperweight. But she soon discovered the power of storytelling through visual media and using science to explain the phenomena that she was capturing. Her career was launched, and now she's a highly respected wildlife photographer. We dive deep into several topics like how she, a BIPOC woman, entered a white, male-dominated field, the conservation issues currently unfolding in Arctic ecosystems, ethical wildlife photography, wild stories from her time in the North, and tips for anyone wanting to follow a similar path. If you enjoy this episode, please give the show a rating and review. Rating the show helps others discover the podcast and gets these amazing conservationist stories out there. Also, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so that you are alerted when the next episode drops. All right, everyone, here is my conversation with Jenny. Well, hi, Jenny. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Your stories are unbelievable. Like, I cannot wait to share the incredible things that you have experienced with everybody. But since you didn't become like some amazing wildlife photographer overnight, how did that happen? What were you like as a young little girl? And, and how'd you get into this? I was born in Calgary, Alberta, refugee family. So my family came from Vietnam, but we are Chinese. So my grandparents actually ran from China to Vietnam. My parents ran from Vietnam to Canada. I am a product of refugees, <laughs> but I grew up pretty conservative, little Asian kid playing piano, doing schoolwork. I actually didn't spend a ton of time outdoors, but my parents love like road tripping. We didn't have a ton of money to, you know, go off to really far places, but we did a lot of day trips and road trips to see family. We had family everywhere as a product of being a refugee. So it was like kind of all across Canada and the US. Out of a love for travel, I pretty much just brought, eventually went on a lot of trips and brought my camera with me, except I just enjoyed the adventure more than I did taking photos. And it was like a paperweight, but eventually it developed into something like I became more accustomed to it. And it was something that always came with me and it took off from there like just storytelling um you enjoy sharing things that the more incredible the experience the more you want to share it with people at home that don't have the experience of being on these adventures with you so kind of was born out of that I think oh nice <laughs> and I, I have to ask one question too because from our last conversation it sounded like you actually studied science really hardcore. Like that was like your thing was different kind of sciences. So why did you decide to go in photography versus pursuing more of like your classic research, maybe biology type career? Um, yeah, so I have a chemistry degree actually. I'm like maybe one or two courses short of a biology degree as well, but I do actually do environmental monitoring for in chemistry as a contractor from time to time. And it has worked well for me. Like I think my fascination with the world is because of 
really ties into my love for science. Like it's just questions and curiosity. And so when I go and see the world, like I'm really interested in geology when I, when I'm on hikes, when I'm looking at plant life, when I'm even looking at mushrooms or uh, (laughs) I have a thing for mushrooms Um, and wildlife and not just taking an image and just actually understanding what I'm taking an image of like the landscape that I'm I'm showcasing, the wildlife that I'm showcasing, really learn about it, look at research that's going on in the area or conservation that is needed in the area. So yeah, I think that really ties into and had a huge part in developing like my career as a photographer or my identity as a photographer is that I'm not really, the image is half of it. And then also understanding what I'm taking a photo of or why I'm taking a photo of. It is really, really important. Mm. And I can totally see that in your work because instead of just focusing on like, you know, like a megafauna photo, you have this unbelievable picture of this landscape and just the way that you see it, like in the layers that you're able to put in and like, oh my gosh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's like, (laughs) did you say that you would go on like hiking adventures and you would be the one that would be off just foraging out all the way? (laughs) There goes Jenny again, like checking out a mushroom or a rock or something. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. We were like looking for polar bears in Churchill and Drew just looks over and he's like, are you looking for mushrooms? I'm like, yeah, there's a mushroom over here. <laughs> I'm studying it right now. I'm like, I wonder if it's edible. <laughs> um, yeah, like I, I think like that's like the funnest thing about being out in the wild is is actually just being mind blown by the little things. And I think when you actually slow down and look at those little things, like you have a greater appreciation for the image, like even if you're not taking a picture of the mushroom, but understanding how that mushroom or the mycelium, the plant life, how that affects the wildlife. Cause like, since I started mushrooming, <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> weird or mushroom hunting. Um, you, you, it's really common to start a journal about when you do find a species and looking at the conditions that are around it. And I think it's really close to what a lot of indigenous knowledge has always been about. They're so in tune with the seasons and the things that are emerging. And when you see a fox coming out of its den, what's happening in its environment? There's certain cues in our environment that trigger other things and certain, it's kind of like our hormones or our, you know, like there's certain triggers in our body and you feel it. And, and it's like seasons in our body. Like that's what I could attune it to, I guess. But when you go out in nature and you pay attention to those little things, it could be tracks, it could be whatever, but there's also smaller things that are more nuanced, like the blooming of a certain flower that is associated with mushrooms. That is also associated with like the migration of birds and other things, right? And when it comes to sea ice, like how thick like what's going on when you look at the flow edge and how thick that ice is and what's going on, how much animals are actually coming because of that thickness of ice and the balance of like having no ice versus having, you know, the perfect retreat of the seasonal ice. Because the seasonal ice does disappear. (laughs) Like we do, like it does disappear every year, but the issue is it's disappearing too fast, Mm. right? And it's not coming back fast enough, but we do need that seasonal ice to kind of like these coronas to open up and to have that the really thick ice thin out a bit so that the sunlight can get through. And when the sunlight gets through, the algae blooms and then everything kind of blue, like everything comes to life in the Arctic. So it's all these like small nuances in the ecosystem that supports everything else. And when you can appreciate the little things, I think you start to see how the fascination of ecology, how everything is connected, right? Ah, oh, yes. Gosh, just this past weekend, I was up in the Rocky Mountains, and this is my favorite time of year is when it's snowy because you can track everything. It's like this, you're just surrounded by stories that you can visibly see 
at this time of year. I mean, you, you can other times, but it's, it's way harder to see the signs versus these beautiful fresh tracks of a red fox or a snowshoe hare or some other thing. And it's just like the hike completely comes alive just, just by looking around. Like, yeah, there's always a mile goal or whatever when we're up in the mountains, but I mean, well, not with me. I'm not, if somebody's hiking with me, that doesn't happen because I'm like, look at that. Look at this. Look at this. Look at that. Look at this. <laughs> I'm sure everybody that goes out with you can relate. Um, that's the exact same way. It's way more fun that way. It is so much more fun that way. And the next thing, so you are so talented and your photography is definitely on a different level. And I, I have to ask this, what about the North? It attracts you. Like, it seems that most of your work comes from like the Arctic and, and just higher latitudes. So what about those ecosystems are you so called to that you, you love to go back? So it kind of started, my mom really wanted to go to Antarctica. And so for her 65th birthday, I brought her to Antarctica. That was in Chinese tradition. We either do, we usually do a massive party that's almost like a wedding and I gave her the option I'm like do you want a like this massive party or do you want to do your dream trip which is Antarctica and she's like I want to go to Antarctica so we went to Antarctica and I was like you know like this is an amazing trip like quite life-changing I think that's when I was like it went from travel to a stronger focus on wildlife mm. and I have been to Africa as well prior but this was the trip where I was like I you can see so much change just even within this, the, the few weeks I was there for 21 days doing this trip. And like, you can see so much change going on and there's such a story unfolding even within 21 days, not just within years, right? Like we can talk about climate change over years, but you can see that change in the landscape. It's such a dynamic landscape. And then I was like, you know, like, from a travel perspective, I'm like, how am I seeing this polar region before I'm seeing my own polar region in Canada? I'm like, there's got to be a way. I'd love to see the Arctic. And I was looking into it and it just seems so far, like such a crazy reach because the Canadian Arctic is more inaccessible actually than financially and like logistically than Antarctica because Antarctica is so well-traveled. And the more I looked into it, the more, you know, it became apparent, like, you know, climate change, like mm. that hits home. And especially within, I'd say like the last, over the last 10 years, like to see all the natural disasters that have flooded our planet and then to, to actually be there and feel like that ice, you know, like that vulnerability that you have when you're standing on sea ice and your foot just going right through you know, yeah. that dependency that you have on sea ice. And it was a very like literal dependency versus I think from afar looking at the Arctic, it was like a very, you know, cool, almost metaphorical, like, I guess like, yeah, it's affecting them more than it's affecting us. But really is it like, I mean, ice and warming and you, you get the correlation up there. And I think in the South, we don't see that. Like not everybody correlates wildfires to climate change. Not everybody's correlating these like way more hurricanes and tornadoes to climate change versus in the Arctic, you're literally seeing it. And it's affecting people's lives in a different way because, and animals too, because there is no other option. Like, mm that sea ice is part of their habitat. It's part of what provides life there. We don't, they don't have like a superstore. Their, their stores are very limited for humans and for animals. Like they don't have stores. Animals have no stores. Humans have a very limited store there. And flying things in isn't really the option for everybody and for everything. So like the country food is really tied to culture I don't know, the more I'm up there, like it went, it was one trip and it, it kind of just changes your perspective of why we really, really like more so the Arctic needs to be shown in that light, like, and those voices that are being affected, like it, 
it's being affected so much quicker and they've seen it for way more generations than we have. It's been slapping them in the face for much longer than for us, right? And to see that, I think like to see what they're going through now is kind of like a foreshadowing of what we're going to go through (laughs) because they're experiencing the warmer three times more, but also their habitat is so much more vulnerable to that. Like they don't, when a town burns down from a wildfire, you can evacuate it in the South, right? People have highways to move to another community. When the Arctic, if the Arctic were to burn down per se, where do you go? There are no roads. There, you, you either fly or the way of life is, is tied to that sea ice. So I think like telling those stories and for people to understand that, you know, perhaps this is like what they're going through up there in terms of wildlife and in terms of humans, it could tell a huge story of what's to come for us and our wildlife. Like polar bears are being affected by climate change, but so are so many animals in the South. And perhaps we're not making that tie really as much like we're if you look at like a list of what's really affecting this animal it's always habitat loss you know and up there it is habitat loss too but it's not from us chopping down trees right it's from emissions that are causing warming and it's melting away right it's deteriorating glaciers that provide fresh water systems. And when you're looking at an Arctic desert, um, there are communities that might run out of water eventually with expanding population up there. So, I mean, you look at wolves and you look at like bears and like fragmented populations in the South, we associate that with loss of habitat instead of climate change. But when you're looking at you know, forest fires and stuff, that really affects like the cycle of the forest and its ability to regenerate. Their habitat is shrinking significantly due to climate change as well, not just from human like degradation of their environment, right? So I don't know, like it, the North is pretty near and dear to my heart for sure, for many reasons. Like it just, I don't know, like I think the more you go up there, the more vested you become in a the community and the wildlife there and to see that connection of what's to come for us I think is is important mm. gosh I cannot agree more with that and I've loved that about your work it's it's very honest it's like this is what I saw this is what I experienced I'm bringing it to you raw like this is this is it and so to go down this further For those of us that aren't professional photographers, we might not understand how this actually works. Like, how do you get a job or or whatever you want to call it, a gig or whatever the the official terms are? So just just teach us like adventure wildlife photography 101. How do you get hired to go to one of these locations to document what's going on? How does that work? So... A, they're called expeditions typically. And majority of the people that go up, honestly, are self-funded on assignments or partially funded. Being fully funded is an upper echelon of, it is, they're really expensive. Like a sea ice trip for five days on the ice typically runs about, I don't know, like 12 to $20,000. And that will give you about like five to six days on the sea ice. Wow. So with, with these expedition companies. And so the flight alone up to some of these communities are 3,300. And these are Canadian dollars, $3,300 from Ottawa. It is pretty North. Like that's not like, we're not talking Montreal or something. Yeah. um, So, I mean, yeah, it's like about, it's a long, like it could be two to three days of flying. Oh, wow. Because like it's, you have to fly to Akala refuel. And usually if you're lucky, you can connect right away to your community. And these flights going into Akala is a regular flight that, that is full. But going into these small communities, 
I think like there might be like 20 seats on the whole plane. And then the, the rest of the plane is actually cargo. So it's a really weird looking cabin that's cut in half. And then from there, like you need someone to give you a chance. There's a sea of talent on social media that people can look at and pick. It's not like back in the day, like you have a little bit of experience. Like there's tons of people that have experience and tons of people that have talent to tell stories. So that really actually falls on luck. And as a female, I think you have to be even more lucky because when it comes to polar expeditions, it's not easy. And for someone to give a a female photographer a chance at an expedition like that, to invest that much money, it's rare to say the least. And it's sad because it's, we're not not tough enough for it. It's just the perception that we're not tough enough for it. And when it comes down to comparing it to our male counterparts, I would say that you have to go above and beyond. Your resume has to look a little bit more extraordinary than your male counterpart. Um, you have to be able to not be afraid of heights. You have to and display that in some way. You have to be you know, tough enough to endure the winters that cold temperature, camping in that weather, like a reputation to actually be able to work with other people in those environments. Like you're not that person that goes out there and taps out. You're not that person that um, says I'm cold and complains all day. Like reputation goes a long ways when it comes to that type of work and be able to produce um, without actually having seen the place before. So a lot of photographers, I would say, on social media have seen the Tetons. They have seen Yellowstone. So when you go there, you have an anticipation, or even Churchill, you have an anticipation of how to shoot a place. Not, And the wildlife is one thing. That is, in my opinion, the easiest. <laughs> it's always easy to impress when you have like a beautiful subject, you know, anything from a moose to a polar bear. But to tell the full story, you have to also be able to capture the environment, the conditions. And that's not easy if, A, you shoot wildlife specifically. A lot of people don't shoot landscape. And B, to shoot that landscape that you've never seen before. To understand, like, wow, like, I've never seen these mountains. I don't understand how to get closer, like the distance that you are from your landscape, sea ice can truncate mountains pretty much because you're like, it it doesn't look like very much sea ice, but you're actually like, you know, miles and miles from those mountains. So when you're shooting it, if you're not using a telephoto, like a lot of landscape artists will use a wide angle, but if you're on sea ice and use wide angle and you're at sea level and those mountains are up there far away, your mountains just look like nothing, right? (laughs) So being able to use all the tools that you have and being able to shoot and produce content is not easy. So a lot of people go up there and they don't necessarily succeed in the way that they were hoping to succeed. So having, it's sad, but yeah, like you need someone to give you a chance to show that you're badass and even more so for a female, essentially. Yeah, and I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up because that's one of the things that I really wanted to take some time during this conversation to chat about and just bring light to because for likely you brought it up that, you know, you have Asian heritage and you're Canadian and you're a woman. And so there's like so many layers to this. Like you don't look like the standard (laughs) image of an adventure photographer which is awesome. Like, I'm, God, I'm so grateful to know you and to help just give your voice out to the world because other people need to see that look like you or that are a woman that like, oh my gosh, she did it. I can do it. And I'm going to reach out to Jenny to be like, girl, how the hell did you do it? Because I want to do it. And so let's go down that a little bit further. If you wouldn't mind, let's say that there is a woman listening and maybe even a woman of color too, which is like another layer to this. If you could speak directly to them, 
what would you say that maybe the steps that they should take or, or maybe some pieces of advice that you've been able to pick out through your journey, what should they have in the back of their mind as they start going down their journey to do what you're doing? Um, so it doesn't cut it anymore to just be a photographer. Like you're good with a camera. Like you have to be able to have other specialties. Like if you look at some of the Nat Geo photographers nowadays, like they can write, <laughs> they are scientists. They understand what they're photographing usually quite well. Um, you have to be culturally inept in, t in terms of being in certain areas. Um, do your research, right? And at the end of the day, like all these things like diving, hiking, like being as fit for your job as possible and as ready to tackle an, an assignment is super, super important. You have to be able to, when you pitch something, be able to showcase all of those things. So understanding like to build that portfolio of storytelling is super important. Like if you can take a pretty image, that's great for an art gallery. But when you're looking at selling a tour, when you're looking at telling a story for a magazine, that doesn't do anything. Like, I'll be honest, like anybody that you pick from Instagram, there's like a ton of people that can take an amazing photograph, but not everybody can take an amazing photograph of an entire story of an experience, right? And, and invite someone in to that experience. So those things are really important. Like you have to understand what your target audience is. Are you just shooting for fine art for a gallery or are you wanting to tell a story? And when you're telling a story, you, you storyboard everything. Like you have to know what your story is before you go and tackle it. Like have ideas of what your, your shoot is going to be when you go and talk to someone. And to be honest, like as much as it is, to the disadvantage of how, like in the views of society of being a female and Asian, there's also a lot of companies that champion that. Mm. You know, they want to say, you know, like this is our hero. Our hero is a female, a BIPOC. Like you, there are companies that support that and that, and you know what? It's awesome to champion those like as a photographer it's awesome to work with companies that really do champion that um, magazines editors that champion that equal opportunity still when it comes to high cost expedition shoots there's still a lot of companies that will still choose a male it's not easy but as a community I think it's also our responsibility to help one another, one another out. So if there are opportunities, always try to put it out there for friends, family, whatever, that would maybe take that opportunity, share one another's work, all that stuff, but also like help each other, like be like, okay, you know, this opportunity is really great for, you know, and then also understand that you're representing that community. So it's totally different for a guy that fails. So if a guy goes up to the Arctic and he fails on his assignment, he taps out, he's too cold, that falls on him. In society's vision, the people that are working with him, in my opinion, they see it as that guy failed. But when a girl fails, when a BIPOC fails, it falls on our entire community. And that's something that I think I shoulder that really heavily. And I, 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 I do think that every time we do succeed, sadly, it does fall on like the opposite. Like I take that credit that I succeeded and it doesn't fall on the community that, you know, still. And I think the more we do that, the more we succeed as a community of females as BIPOCs, the more people see it. Oh, you know, it's not just this girl. It's like a, a double standard for men and women. When a guy fails, it's just on him. When a girl succeeds, it's just on her. But when a guy succeeds, it's because he's a guy. Versus when a girl fails, it's on everybody. Like, it's like, oh, she's just a girl. She's too weak. She's too, you know, she's not tough enough. And she tapped out. And 
I think that that is a reality of, of how people perceive the situation. I don't know if you can relate to that. Oh all. girl. Oh, hell yeah. I have some freaking Lily. Oh my goodness gracious. Yeah. People see me and they have a very particular image that comes to mind. And I'm like, well, you're in for a treat because everything you think is not true. And that's just a part of society and all of us working together to raise each other's voices. And why I love this platform so much to be like, okay, let's say that, you know, I pull up my phone right now. I see one of your photos and I'm like, oh, okay, that, that's really nice. And then I go to your profile and see who it is that's actually photographing. Like, that's awesome. Like, that's amazing. Like, that is awesome. And like, to show to be like, everyone go to Jenny's page and see the incredible stuff she's doing and, and then look at her and be like, see someone she's badass. Like she is so badass. And we are going to get into some stories of why, like you do some stuff that I don't, I don't even know. I, the strongest, most, I don't know, burly men in my life probably can't do the stuff you can like listening to some of your stories. They'd freaking tap out and like immediately. It sounds really hard. But before we get to that, before we moved on, you mentioned some companies and some organizations that are very diverse focused and are very, you know, willing to hire that person based on their talent, not necessarily by what they look like. Would you want to give a shout out to some of those companies? And then maybe people listening could start there that maybe that who, who can I go support? Yeah. Does anybody come to mind? Yeah, like, so Bath and Safari, they gave me my first job in the Arctic, pretty much. It's funny because John was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he asked me if I wanted to do this additional part of this trip, which included commuting from Clyde River to Pond in Inlet. It's a snowmobile trek camping for 400 kilometers to get to our final camp. And I was like, yeah, sure. That sounds great. That sounds like a great <laughs> adventure. He's like, are you sure you're tough enough? And I'm like, no idea, just said yes. <laughs> like it's like, he was very explicit. He's like, it's nothing like you've ever done before. Like, he's like, I don't care if you've climbed Kilimanjaro or any of those things, like it's, it's hard and it's tough and this is not a tour. And I'm like, yep. He gave me that chance. And I mean, I'm so grateful. I think that one expedition just, is that star on my resume that made me capable of getting other jobs. Arctic Bay Adventures also, I mean, they brought me into the community. They're a community owned outfit in Arctic Bay. And they really like, we communicated for I think like two years until I actually went up there. They brought me into the community. Community really took me in, made amazing friends there. I fell in love with the place. But yeah, like they gave me the opportunity as well over all the people that would have asked. The Arctic is is pretty sought out for assignments and stuff. And they chose me. So I'm super, super grateful for that. Um, Canada Goose, uh, they've always supported like indigenous designers. They just created a Tigi, which is, uh, well, not created, but like it's been an ongoing project. And every year they hire a different highlight a different Inuit designer and they design um, an exclusive one-of-a-kind line for the company and proceeds not only benefits the designer but also communities in the north so there's like quite a few companies out there that are willing to work with like a diverse group of people LGBTQ women and BIPOCs so for me, those three companies definitely stand out. Um, and like Polar Bears International, I mean, there's a fleet of amazing photographers out there and I've been fortunate to get to work with them as well. Mm -hmm. Those are some great names. Yeah, so, and if everyone was like, Brooke, what was that? I'll make sure they're in the show notes. So don't worry about that. I'll make sure that we have them all listed so that they can get their due credit because I, I'm the exact same way. If somebody is doing it right, I want to shout their name from the rooftops So because our dollars mean a lot and our support means a lot and what we put out there means a lot. And so if we could be like, please go support Canada Goose versus what other, you know, coat manufacturer 
because of this reason, then that I feel like that should be highlighted. So absolutely, I will make sure that I'll put links to all of them because they deserve it. They deserve it. But okay, so we have teased everybody enough about your amazing badass trips that you do and all this incredible stuff. Every time we've chatted, my jaw has just been on the on the floor. I'm like, I don't even I don't even know how you do what you do. So let's just start just telling me some stories. Is there any recent projects or a recent assignment or expedition that comes to mind that you could take us through and what it was like, what it was, what the goal was, what you photographed, what was the outcome? Yeah, just blow us away, please. <laughs> so I'd say like my last assignment that really, really blew me away was Arctic Bay. I finally got to go up there, like I said, after almost two years of talking to the company and the community about actually a flow edge trip that got canceled <laughs> because of the pandemic. And so they invited me to go up instead in the summer and it was to kickstart their tourism. I brought a videographer up with us and we stayed in the community and we had ventured around so many cool experiences like just we had narwhals coming like right up to our boat bowhead whales co coming right up to our boat hiking in the arctic was just mind-blowing like the the landscape is like utah and iceland had a baby <laughs> <laughs> love the visual <laughs> um, it's something that's so unexpected because i think everybody thinks that the arctic is just blue ice snow and that's what everybody goes up there to capture but there's like a very short special season where everything retreats you know and the land is able to breathe and it's summer and it's a very short season and it's so colorful it's like rainbow colors of greens and reds especially in that area because there's like a very high iron content and so the rocks are all red. Hence the Utah. <laughs> Utah. Rainbow colors, such a high mineral content there. Um, sea stacks and everything. But I think like one of the coolest things was, was actually just being way more immersed in the community and getting to know so many individuals. Like personally, I got to go to a wedding. One of the guides invited me out to their wedding and I photographed the wedding, sent him wedding photos. And like enjoying food cooked in so many different ways. Like on the sea ice, I got to try the muktuk, which is a narwhal um, in 2019, I believe. But it was raw, which is great. But when I was, and I got to try the seal, but when I was in the community, I got to try it in so many different ways, like in chowder, like baked. I got to meet a lot of the, the kids and like the, there's a, group there called the guardians which help harvest food for people that don't have the means to harvest food up there so it's an organization within the community of hunters that and hunting is an expensive venture in terms of like you need to have like a boat or you need to have snowmobile not everybody have the has those means up there and so they have an organization that harvests food for the community and that actually rings true even without these organizations in this community, in, in Arctic communities, I find. In 2019, when I was in Clyde River, I saw a fishing derby come in with a ton of fish. And it was for everybody, like everybody went and got their fish. Like a select group of people went out, but the entire community was fed. Anybody who wanted food could go and get it, including me. <laughs> like, wow. you should get food. You should go and get fish if you want fish. And I was like, oh, that is so kind. Like, it's I don't think we know the meaning of community until you actually go up to these communities and you actually see the type of sharing and collectiveness, like the sense of family that you actually feel within the community beyond just your little unit in your household, I guess. It's amazing. I think that's what I love about the Canadian high Arctic is, and I don't know, like, I haven't seen the other parts of the high Arctic, but there's a lot of it that is also uninhabited. Like it, it has been developed for tourism. 
and that the local population actually like a local indigenous population doesn't actually live in or you're on a ship and you don't actually get to experience it to that extent um and get to know people like that i gotta sit down with capic who is like a uh, hundred years old elder a hundred years old yeah she's oh gonna be one this year oh. <laughs> Yeah, she's awesome. Um, I like cried, like actually being in her presence is such an honor. She's actually the, the last surviving bone collector. What's a bone collector? So during the war, World War II, I believe. Yeah, I think it was World War II. She collected bones for resources to create glue for aviation glue and like bombs and stuff. What? yeah like so the hot like I think that's a, a story that is left out in our education of Inuit contributions towards the wars <laughs> like there was quite a bit that happened up there like they they went out collected bones in seal bags and carried them back to be shipped down south for the war I and had no idea. Oh my like, gosh. Even like dog bones and everything. Like they, they sacrificed so much for the war. And she was one, she's the last surviving one of these people that did it back in the day. And it's, it, it's amazing. Like, I think that part of history, like this heroism has been left out in a lot of people's education. And yeah, I did an interview with her and she's amazing. She like, I don't know if you know, where Baffins is, but she's actually from like the coast of, I guess, northeastern Hudson's kind of oh. area. Yeah. But through her lifetime, she migrated on dog sled all the way up there. What? <laughs> she's amazing. Like, and she's like an amazing runner back in the day. And like, she's got so many kids. And actually the wedding that I went to was her um, adopted daughter's wedding. Wow. And you were able to record her story. So it's like living somewhere. Her story. Yeah. Have like, yeah. We have it on um, video. So it's like, it was a very special like thing to just get to sit down and talk to her. She's just got so many stories and so much to learn from her, um, from her life experience. It's oh my gosh. like, and such a sweet, like lady soft-spoken um yeah there's a special energy about that experience I would say don't you just love we we go to these places for the wild we go to these places for the the spectacular nature that we want to see and it's always the people it's always the people that I yeah. always fall in love with going around everywhere you know all over the world now and it's it's the people that I have stories with of like I had a beer with this person and and guess the story that they told me I mean that's part of the reason why this podcast exists is because I would travel around and I would just be at a campfire with my guide or whoever it would be in a local community and they would just start telling me these stories and I'm like why is nobody hearing this this is yeah. literal gold pouring from your mouth and I'm the only person hearing this right now Oh, it sounds like, yeah, you might've had some similar experiences. <laughs> yeah, it's like, and even like local mythology, Inuit mythology, but there's also like local stories of that are, are very specific to certain communities. It's incredible. And I, th I think you also realize that from your travels as well, like talking to people and experiencing the wild as well as the community aspects of it is that like, that's the key to conservation is like mm. that intersection of the local communities with the habitats that surround them. Scientists, photographers, we all leave eventually. You know, we're there to visit, we're there to do our research, we're there to do X, Y, Z, but that's their land. That's their, you know, their home. And they're the ones that are affected by it directly they're the ones that have voices invested interest in to really give a voice to if you love the wildlife if you love the habitat and the landscape it's about empowering local community to actually like 
it has to be their voice and we can help support them but it has to be their voice because it's their it's their land it's their habitat it's their you know home and when we leave we leave that in their hands as scientists as conservationists whatever if they're not vested in protecting it no matter what we do as and it's just like the the world like the scientists have given the information and the data the photographers have told their stories to the world about climate change about habitat loss about anything but if people don't and government don't want to make those changes you know up for our home local government to you know global entities like if we don't want to make those changes then for our home then it it doesn't matter like the research the the photography the storytelling none of it matters we're not making the impact if the people that inhabit this don't want to make that change right right could not agree more yeah just having spent so much time in africa and, and studying like african predators and, and human wildlife conflict i mean it's the exact same thing too and it's i definitely feel like now and it sounds like you also feel it as well and pretty much everyone i sit down with now agrees that there's this shift starting in conservation where it used to be very as like brad Nahil said in a recent episode like a very colonialistic way of doing conservation where normally like a white well-educated professor of some well-known university would go to a place say this is the issue this is how we need to solve the issue that is it and then yeah. all of these regulations are put in place with very often the local the local people aren't included in this and they are the biggest stakeholder in this whatever the issue is wherever it is and I'm starting to see that this is really starting to change and having people like you to go to these places and actually say what's going on is so immensely helpful and grateful. And, and I just, I can't imagine, like, I, I really want to sit down and I want to hear the story so bad of her and her story right now. Like you have me so emotionally invested and you just told me about it. And, and yeah, yes, we have all of these issues that we're dealing with as well in, in these areas, but like, man, I want to, I want to meet her. <laughs> like, yeah. She's, she's absolutely <laughs> like a gem. Like you, I think like you're, you're blessed with the presence of like, just so much knowledge you've seen. She's seen so much experience so much. Like she's experienced war. She's experienced like a transition of traditional, in, incredibly traditional Inuit life all the way to when colonialism really, really took a stronghold in their communities with like the scoops and everything. And then now where I think Inuit communities are having a very strong voice and reclaiming a lot of their traditions and culture, but at the same time, they're also seeing a degradation of the landscape due to climate change. And with climate change, there's gonna also be like, you know, a huge movement towards developing the North. And oh. there will be opportunities as well. Um, you, you can't leave that out. You can't just be like, you know, what is climate change actually gonna do? It will take away, I think, hunting opportunities, but it also, opens up these ideas of turning the Arctic into the next Panama Canal. <laughs> um, it also opens up the development of, you know, mining operations and oil and gas and all the stuff in the North. And so we have to see where they want to go with that. I mean, to say that they don't, to say no, 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 because we don't live there when we've done this to our own community isn't right. We have to, let them make those decisions, but also give them all the information, statistically, our own experience of what we've done to our lands, from mining, from what has happened in Panama, like what can happen to whale populations even more so if you increase tanker traffic. Oh my gosh, yes. Traffic, right? If you 
But at the same time, they also have to balance out like the prosperity that it can bring. And we cannot deny that the explo exploitation of our own habitats in the South have not brought in prosperity to our communities. I mean, we live in communities with heated homes. We have roads, we have, I mean, it's really awesome to be a tree hugger and to just be like, you know, negate all that stuff. But every one of us have benefited from that. I mean, we're, I'm working on a computer, right? With electricity and all of that is powered by, you know, unsustainable means. And it's important to also recognize that, you know, we have prospered from that. We've made those choices and we were given that opportunity to make choices like that. Did we make the right choice? I don't know. Like, I mean, it's hard to say, right? Like, I mean, we've all benefited from it, but at the same time, we're all losing a lot from it as well. I think it's important that Indigenous communities in the high Arctic also have the opportunity to make those choices for themselves, as well as us giving them as much information as we can from our experience of what we've done to our lands. That's all. Right? Have you like, seen much um, internal conflict? Like, like, have you been in one of these communities and there's very polarized views of what the future is going to hold from for these communities within the communities? Or um, what are you seeing? I think, so like the hunting and trapping organization is really strong about conservation of sea ice, of whatever they can do to preserve wildlife and hunting, essentially. So in terms of like trenching sea ice for mining operations, I've seen quite a large movement towards, you know, like let's not trench that sea ice year round. Um, they're only allowed to ship mine. So there's a iron ore mine in ba on Baffins. And I think right now they're only allowed to ship it once a year when the sea ice opens up. And they want to expand the mine so that they can ship year round. But in order to do that, they would have to trench sea ice. Oh. And so there's been quite a bit of petitioning about that. There are communities that do benefit from it. And then, and I, I have seen it, like, I mean, they provide quite a bit of financial income and support for communities in the area that no other entity can actually provide. <laughs> It's, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, unless you're in these communities and you see, I mean, is the government really helping in terms of like the cost of living up there, even just in a not so remote community like Kakalawit, like it is remote, but in terms of Baffins, that is the largest city. And you're looking at like 700,000 for our trailer, like size home. That's a lot of money. And like when you're looking at cost of food, like how much it costs for a can of pop or anything like that, it's a lot. Like you're looking at like, you know, $7. Everything is either flown in or it was brought in by ship. And housing. I mean, just rental alone. Like there's not enough housing for people. So like there could be 14 people living in a trailer size home. Wow. That's not something that I think the South can fathom, let alone understand, right? So when someone is willing to give you some sort of financial, it's easy for you to judge sitting in a home that is super comfortable and you have a single family home with literally a single family in there. But when you're looking at the situation that is there and I'm, they're not poor, it's just that it's the disparity there is like, it's impossible. Like, you know, unless there is more shipping of goods to build homes there. I don't know. It's really, really, really tough. Like, I can't even describe, like, the lack of resources or support that they have. And if someone's going to give them support, I can't fault them for taking it. Right. And it's kind of like in Africa, I don't think people actually want to poach things. <laughs> I think like when people are like, oh, you know, it's just a horrible, whoever's like shooting these rhinos and these elephants are just horrible people. I think you also have to understand the poverty that people are actually living in and the situation that turns someone into a poacher, right? 
it's really easy for us to judge when we don't when we're never hungry or we're never you know we don't live through droughts and we don't have you know all our kids go to school and you don't even think about having to pay for school or the fact that your kid is in school and isn't working a field or something like that so yeah it's our standards of living that we imply on other communities and it's a very colonial and it's not to our fault either that's how we're wired right but it's also about you know being woke about the situation that is out there like we live honestly in a western world like anybody who's probably listening to this podcast we're like a two percent in this world like majority of people don't live in the standards of living that we're living in right and the choices that have been given to us like even just being able to do trips jump on an airplane and do trips to just photograph things like go on holidays like this is not a thing that people do international travel it's a very first world experience still even though like through the pandemic people are like oh my goodness I'm dying like I can't (laughs) and I can't do these things and I'm just like you know this is a very first world issue because yes most people in Southeast Asia or in Africa might not have ever left the continent of Africa (laughs) or you know with like they might have jumped over to from Vietnam to Thailand or maybe within Asia but like not everybody in Vietnam or not everybody in Africa has the opportunity to travel far and wide. (laughs) Absolutely. And I just, I love these points that you bring up so much. And and when you see it firsthand, I think it all makes sense way more because there's so many issues now that are quote unquote issues that people might be very opposed to, which again, like you said, I do understand like for, and you know, going back to Africa and I'm sure you, you've probably experienced this in the Arctic as well, of like different styles of hunting, like trophy hunting is a very controversial topic. And, and sometimes, yeah, could I ever do that? No. But if that is the solution that a local community decides is going to fund them, Who am I to tell them that they're wrong? You know, like if it's well managed and with strict quotas and whatever, I might not agree with that, but who am I to say how they should run their community? I have no business unless there is a way to give them an opportunity that will bring them more money than whatever shooting that lion is going to give them. Then who am I to say? I have no right. I have no right sitting on my whatever, I can't even say ivory tower, but you know what I mean? Like, who, who am I to say? I, I don't have a family that I have to support. Like, yeah. if that lion takes my head of cattle, it doesn't, it doesn't affect me here. But if that was me and I was, you know, a, a, let's say that as a woman, I was in a community in that way, I would probably, so I just turned 30. So I would probably have, I don't know, six, seven children that, and I would be fully dependent on my husband to make money to feed our family and to hopefully get them a somewhat prosperous life. That is so far from my comprehension that I have absolutely no right to judge in any way on someone else's way of life, you know? And I'm sure you've seen it. And I, I, this is also something I really wanted to talk about. Um, you, you briefly mentioned it of like some of the whale hunts that happen up in the high Arctic. And I was just really curious if, since you are sharing these stories in a very authentic way, have you ever received pushback from people that might not understand the full situation or might not understand the culture? Like, ha- have you gotten anything negative so from this stuff? So I don't usually, because like, I'm going to be super honest. Like I don't, it's not my voice. It's not my story when it comes to that, like that very touchy topic of hunting, when it comes to polar bears, I will speak out about it in terms of polar bears is polar bear hunting actually affecting the population. It is as of right now done sustainably. It's climate change. Don't take that away from the fact that our emissions in the South 
are impacting more than a guy who's hunting to feed it and clothe his family. And if even if it is a trophy hunt, that meat is being used, you know, like nothing gets wasted in the north. Um, it can't be. <laughs> so in terms of the whale hunt, I don't talk about it because it has been super controversial and it has burnt them a lot there. I ate narwhal up there. There was like some articles about, you know, the ivory trade of Canada. And if you're going to take an animal, I hope that you take the animal that's going to bring the most value. That's one life. Mm. Take the, the life that is going to bring the most amount of value to you. Because there is actually no difference in the wild. It's actually better to take a horned animal in terms, when it comes to a narwhal, it's better to take a horned animal than a non-horned animal. And they're very good about taking that. Like they're not shooting blindlessly into the water. They're not, you know, they, there's technique, a ton of technique. I have been there when they've done it. And I've seen the techniques that they've used. They buoy the animal before they even shoot it. So they see like they're physically there to see if it has a horn or not. Right. And if you're going to take an animal, A, if it has a horn, it's probably a male. Higher chance that it's a male. So you're actually not depleting possibly a female that can carry or is carrying another narwhal, right? And the other aspect is if you're going to take a life, the life with a horn is actually going to provide more for the community total in terms of muktuk, like the skin that they're eating, meat, oils and financial, right? For the community. Is there anything wrong with that? Like, I think that it's like this idea of these very visceral images that uh, media is posting of be it pharaohs or be it, you know, I mean, it looks horrible. Right. It's very, very hard to digest that when we buy meat wrapped in plastic. Mm -hmm right? If you buy meat wrapped in plastic, you haven't even seen a cow. <laughs> you haven't even seen a pig that has been butchered and let alone a whale, which looks completely different from any type of meat that you consume. If you were to walk into a butcher, like into a slaughterhouse and see cows slaughtered or pigs slaughtered, would you feel the same way? Would you have an uproar about it? You know, like, and it's our issue of being so detached from our food source, I think. Because I don't think that they're reacting necessarily to the article. Majority of people are looking at the images and reacting to it, in my opinion. Like the number of people are, they're drawn to the, the article because of that image. Right. And it's our own rewiring of our brains. Like it's our detachment from food and not being able to process that people eat. <laughs> like animals and everyone has a footprint. If it's done sustainably, what are we to say? There are quotas on these things, right? And when it comes to polar bear, I mean, like, I don't like seeing it, obviously. Like, I mean, I love polar bears and I wouldn't personally do it, but it provides a living. And also it provides research too. A lot of people don't understand that a lot of the hunters provide data, like samples, for research and for what we know, everything from seal seal hunters to polar bear, like there are programs out there that collect samples so that you can see like, you know, from the, from the blood analysis, from the pelts or whatever, that what are they eating? How big are these animals that they're harvesting? From there, you can tell like how healthy maybe a population is or you know, what the different ecosystems are going on or the different seasons that they're hunting. Like scientists have collected data. A lot of the polar science wouldn't be possible without these hunters that really know the ice and really know these animals for many. And actually, I just read one article about denning because I'm doing some denning stuff. And there's like so little data collected by scientists, like, in certain areas that it's super important to pull that indigenous knowledge that like they have it mapped out where they have seen denning, where denning occurs historically. And it's interesting to see some places the denning happens on the ocean, 
like on the sea ice and offshore and some happen inland, like on certain slopes and stuff. So I think in remote communities, regardless of where you are, I think like pulling on that indigenous knowledge is so valuable for scientists. And a lot of that indigenous knowledge is coming from people that are vested in the animals, which means that that's their food source. Like that is, that is why they know so much about the animals. It's not <laughs> because, you know, like they're just out there photographing bears. Like they're not. You know, that wasn't what they were doing a hundred years ago or a thousand years ago. They have thousands of years of knowledge about these animals because they hunt them. They eat them. They need them. They need them more than we need them. Right? Right. They need them for photos. They need them for food. <laughs> so. Yes, absolutely. And I feel like that exact thing that story is most places I've been that exact story. And you brought up something that leads to my next question. That is a big hot topic right now. And I'm glad it is because it, this conversation needs to be had and it's the power of images. Cause you mentioned like, you know, someone seeing that image of that narwhal and like, Oh my gosh, this is awful. Whale hunts. And images are insanely powerful, which leads to the question of ethical wildlife photography. And while social media has been bad about some things, social media has also been good about some things and really bringing this issue to light of ethical wildlife photography. And I'm sure you have thoughts and opinions and knowledge and all kinds of stuff on this topic, you know, being an ethical wildlife photographer yourself. So what are you seeing? Are there some examples of like people maybe doing it wrong and like, what is the proper way and how does someone do ethical wildlife photography? So it's been like, oh, it's kind of a weird I feel like the standards are very different depending on where in the world you're photographing, right? My standards in Canada, in North America, I would say the golden standard is very similar. In North America, we even talk about flash photography, doing flash at night, tra trapping at night. I mean, do you like a flash in your eyes? Right? Like it's, it makes you see stars, let alone for a nocturnal animal that's not used to seeing that type of light. In Africa, you can actually go in a, a safari truck at night and do that, like be physically out there, shining bright lights into a field where an animal's trying to hunt and make a living, <laughs> you know? And those lights will affect their hunting ability. But to, in, in most instances, that's completely okay. And in North America, I think you're not allowed to do that inside of a park, I'm pretty sure, right? right? And even camera trapping within a park, you need a permit. So I think it depends, like it really depends on where you are. But for me, there's like these weird ideas of like, you know, I want to be original. So I want to use short glass to photograph wildlife. And I think the only way to really do that is with remotes. If you're bragging about how close you are getting to an animal for no good reason, like if you're petting an animal, typically, oh. it's just kind of like a, if you're going to an organization that lets you get really close, like that's their bragging rights, is that you're going to get a whole little baby tiger, there is usually an issue, right? Like those are easy red flags is if you're going into an, a place where they're, they're guaranteeing you wildlife, Outside of, don't get me wrong, I think if you go to an African safari, they will probably guarantee you wildlife, maybe not guarantee you specific species, but actually, like, I kind of was talking to Dave Sanford about this, is that in the polar world, we think that Antarctica ruins you for Arctic, because when you go to Antarctica, you got, like, a ton of penguins, and that's kind of what you're going for, right? So your expectations are just, like, so high of seeing animals and then you go to the arctic and it's like it's like quiet you like you go <laughs> see the polar bear you like an arctic fox wanders by and you're like whoa you know like this is awesome versus like 
Antarctica, you're surrounded. And it's kind of similar when you look at Africa, you go to Africa, a photographer that goes to Africa, you're guaranteed so much content. And same with like Yellowstone and Tetons area, you're guaranteed almost to see something. Mm -hmm. It might not be that animal that you're looking for, but you're guaranteed to see something. You're going to make some images. And to have those expectations, it's unrealistic. Wildlife photography is not guaranteed. There's nothing guaranteed about wildlife photography. It's not landscape. You show up and you shouldn't have expectations. You have a shot list. Don't get me wrong. You can have a shot list. You have a dream list or whatever. But if you're constantly pushing for the animals to do something, you're going to probably push your guides to do something that is not in the best interest of the animals, right? To get something totally original, you have to start when I see something that's totally original, totally out of the blue, weird. I start questioning like how, where, how did you do this, right? Is this actually a one-off where that animal actually swooped in right in front of you with a, and you had a wide angle lens, like you have a wide angle lens and you were able to get this bird of prey to swoop in in front of you. Did you bait that bird? Because birds don't do that. They don't swoop into a human to catch something, you know? There's a lot of things that you look at and I think we're getting really good. There's a, a huge community that's getting really good at seeing an image and being like, how did that person take that image? And you have to be careful about, I think, what you like on social media because yes. you push, when you double tap that image, you're saying that that was okay. And you're encouraging other people to try to meet that expectation and standard for those likes. And people figure out pretty quick. There's like one image of like a kingfisher going into a fish tank. Like if you really think about it and you like, how is that even possible? Like you can't possibly guess where that kingfisher is going to go in, right? So like then you start doing some research and yeah, they use little tanks inside of and they bait them with fish inside of the tank and then the kingfisher goes into the tank but I mean they're diving at crazy speeds they can break their beaks at the bottom of that tank on their exit they can hit the walls of the of the clear tank kind of thing super unethical a to bait but let alone to bait to that degree is like another level of danger it's not even like a mice in a field for an owl like this is it's not habituation this is just pure danger you're putting them it's like a running car so there's even like tutorials now like you can buy workshops that teach you how to set up this tank oh my god and so yeah like you really have to question what you're doing out there like why are you doing this like do you really care about the animal and then like is if at any point a, I think you're putting yourself in danger. Like if you're bragging about how dangerous that animal is to you, I feel like there could be some ethical issues. Like you have to start like, not saying that every situation is like that. A, you have to trust your guides, but you also have to be like, you know, if you're out there by yourself and you're like, oh, you know, like I can see my reflection. I think it was a David Yarrow. I can see my reflection in a polar bear's eyes. And I'm just Why like, are you that close to a polar bear? <laughs> I was like, we could get pretty close with a good bear guide that knows how to read a bear, I guess. But there's no reason why you should be seeing your reflection in his eyeballs. And talking about it in that light, like it's like this, we should stop glorifying these hero mantras of, getting close to wildlife it's like that oh my goodness what an amazing experience it was to be so close to a to an animal we read it and it's like oh don't get me wrong like I, you read any of those stories especially back in the day in Nat Geo those were very very common stories that draw you in and it makes you want to be a wildlife photographer it makes you want to be out there but we're glorifying something that probably shouldn't happen most of the times, like, you know, you shouldn't be close to an elephant seal pup to the point where they're touching you. You're letting that happen, right? Like you could step back, you can move away from that 
that interaction was purely because you wanted that interaction, right? That was for you, not for the seal pup, not for, you know, um, when it comes to a fox getting too close. I mean, foxes are urban wildlife for the most part, and they're like incredibly habituated, but you're just feeding into that For every one person that does that, there's like another 10 people that are doing that. And eventually it becomes a problem fox, right? So I think like stop glorifying those experiences, right? As much as we can. I mean, it, we love sharing our experiences and it happens in the wild. Don't get me wrong. Like it, it's happened to all of us, like an amazing encounter, an encounter that you have you know, taken dear to your heart, but those encounters should be really far and few in between. For the most part, like an ethical photographer uses a freaking telephoto. <laughs> <laughs> really big, big lens. <laughs> yeah. Like it's not like you shouldn't be like every day, like, oh, I love this fox encounter. I'm petting it. <laughs> and like, you know, I'm so close to an owl or I'm so close to any animal, like continually glorifying that experience just makes other people have this expectation that that is what wildlife photography is really about when I would say that 95% of the time 99% of the time it is telephoto right we all have experiences but we shouldn't be glorifying those experiences and social media like it used to be okay like I mean you think of back in the day it's one thing to see that one-off image, but now with social media, it's like every day you see images, right? Every day you see experiences. And when everybody's talking about these experiences of close encounters, you're thinking that like for a young aspiring amateur photographer that's trying to get into it, that's the expectation that they have is that when you go into the field, it's okay to be this close. You should be approaching this fox. You should be approaching this bear. And that's not the case. So I think expectations are pretty, and it's hard on guides. I think like when people have expectations like that, that they go to Costa Rica, they go to Africa, they go to anywhere. And they, they think that that's what wildlife photography, I should be getting closer. Why am I not closer? They get upset with their guides or they pressure their guides to do more. And I mean, it is work and some guides, you know, fall to the pressure of it. Right. It's not easy. I mean, it is it's easy for us to judge from afar, but when when you, when you're looking at these guides, but I mean, it's, it's their job and it's their livelihood. And when people have expectations like that, it's like, it's really hard for them, I think. Yeah. Thanks for exploring that. (laughs) (laughs) Those were so good. Those were such great points. And I think too, hearing it come from somebody who is so entrenched in this world where, you know, you do have these beautiful images and it's like that, what those didn't happen at the cost of wildlife at the cost of these things. Like you can still have an insanely beautiful portfolio and not have to cross those lines into unethical decisions. Like you can still have stunning a stunning instagram a stunning website you could still have all of that and it's just maybe being more creative taking more of the story in that where are you where's this landscape like and again i'm so glad that you brought up not liking photos that have unethical practices i am so big about that because i'll just like go on and there's like hashtag conservation and then the stuff i see on there i'm like you're calling this conservation (laughs) Is there a way for me to like thumbs down this? I don't know. Like, how can I like tell you not only do I not like it, but I hate it. Like, how can I just get this or gone? (laughs) So I think the biggest moral of the story, if I could bullet point that, your likes matter on social media. Be skeptical of super extraordinary images because I've been in the wild a lot. You've been in the wild a lot. I only have like this many extraordinary photos and I'm in the wild all the time. And if you have to pay for an experience to photograph animals at close range, think about it. Think twice, take three times, and probably just turn around. They don't need your money. And again, if it's an animal that's deadly in any way, just don't. I know I've said this multiple times on the podcast, but just like, just don't, just don't. 
Just don't go near. <laughs> in any way, shape, or form, just don't go near. Just don't go near it. Oh, that was so good. Okay, my next thing is super fun. We're going we're gonna to switch gears a little bit. What is your craziest or wildest story that you've experienced from the field? Ugh. And you can take that in any direction that you want. In terms of, I'm just going to say wildlife stuff. I would say, oh, there's so many. But I would, <laughs> say, I would say, I would say in the Arctic, we're like, it's going back to close experiences. We were, I was going to say goodbye to some friends that were camped out at like the flow edge. They're Inuit. They are very ballsy. They camp right at the edge. Like we said, like the edge deteriorates faster and it keeps on receding. They camp right at the edge. We were camped way back. <laughs> um, so I was going to say goodbye. It was like my last day there. Um, so went out in the morning and right when I got there, there's a polar bear like right beside their camp. They've been <laughs> inside the polar bear all night. But there's always someone up. Don't get me wrong. It's 24 hours of daylight. So there's always someone up. So I'm like, wow, like he's been there all day, like all night, all day. Like he's like, yeah, like kind of went for a little swim and came back. I'm like, can I photograph him? <laughs> like, that's you mind. I'm like, yeah, like go ahead. Like, so I'm like on my stomach, like, you know, at the edge of their camp, kind of in between a snowmobile and whatever. And the bear is close to their camp. And I'm like, just kind of like positioning myself. And the bear like looks up and I'm like, can you just look up, like stop eating? It was eating a narwhal mm. yes. that was already harvested. Um, so they take a lot of the, the muktuk, which is like the skin. It's what has the highest concentration of vitamin D. But because there's electricity nowadays, they only need so much blubber at home. Like they don't need as much blubber that they would typically harvest. So they leave a lot of that for other wild species that are on ice. They'll just put it out there instead of bringing it back to the community, which would actually lure the bears back into the communities mm. uh, and wildlife, which they don't need. So they leave that it's that stuff out there and the bears will eat it or a fox will come and get it. So he, that's what he was eating. And I was like, can you just look up? Just look up. Please look up. Like, like, like that's what I was hoping for. And it did. And when it looked up, it like, it's just like, I'm going to walk towards her. <laughs> like, I was just like, ah! I'm like on my stomach. I'm like, I, like no sudden movements, right? No, like, don't, you don't want to startle him. I don't like, you know, I'm just like, try to shimmy back in my little missionary position. <laughs> and I was like called out to the guys. I'm like, guys, this bear's like walking towards us. It wants Chinese food. I don't know. Like it wants Chinese food. Yeah. Like so all my in your friends like just got up and then they like started yelling at it in Inuktitut and like the bear just walked right around us. <laughs> and like I left and I was talking to the guys like the next day and he's like, yeah, the bear came back after a while just wanted to go for a walk I was like oh cool <laughs> <laughs> oh my so god it's kind of a it's a very interesting experience being on the flow edge it's like a coexistence when you see how like don't get me wrong they don't usually enjoy having a curious bear around like that interaction for them is like how it usually goes down is like they'll jump on their snowmobiles and scare the bear away or um, they'll be yelling at it to get, make it go away. Those are usually like, from what I've seen, the best case scenario situation. Mm. That's what they want is like, you know, the bear either doesn't come or if the bear comes, they kind of can. And I've seen them fire guns at the bear's feet to make it retreat, like some super crazy curiosity happening there. But there's no avoiding that, you know? The, like and that just happens more and more with if you're up in the arctic and you you realize like it's not there's planning for there is fighting against climate change there's also planning for climate change as well like adaptation planning and in churchill there's a lot of research going on with that so with pbi they did like radar studies a like to so that if you have development in the Arctic, for example, for an industry, you need to be able to successfully detect dens, which they haven't been able to. So some, some of the new technology can better detect dens to say, you know, this area is off limits, but for development, 
but also like to prevent human wildlife conflict. That's only going to happen more and more when the bears spend more time on land. So um, that is my like, I think most epic, crazy like experience. Cause like it was like, I was, I felt like I was in a compromised position. Like I have never had a bear. That was my first polar bear that we were tracking pretty much consistently. And I have seen him super curious where the guys had to shoot guns at its feet in another camp further away. Those hunters were not, they wouldn't even let him come close. Like that camping next to them was not a choice. So everybody's kind of a little bit different with their comfort level, but it's also about the personality of the bear or the mood of the bear, I guess. Mm. And, and so when that bear approached that that camp over there, they were like, get out. Like you cannot, you cannot even hang out in this area because it's just too dangerous for us and for you. So they scared him off. But my other friends were just like, whatever, if he's not going to be aggressive to us and he's just eating over there, we're just going to leave him. And it wasn't until he approached that, <laughs> like, get out of here, like, you know, scat. And I think like, to some degree, like the bears get to know the dynamics of what's going on on the ice with the people. So that experience was eye-opening for me because it's it is a very close encounter for me, and I got to see how people interact with wildlife there, and to actually see I think like how the bears actually learn so fast about what's going on. Like he knew not to, like he knew there's food here. I don't need to attack these people. Like there's a body language about it that he's like, I'm just curious. I'm just walking by, like. And like, what's he, your problem? Like, I'm fine. <laughs> it, was new. it was just like standing your ground about letting him know even mm. more, reinforcing that, like, stay away from us. We don't want to pet you. Get away, you know? And it's interesting because like, I mean, in Kaktovik, you see the bears coming season after season back with that community that does like bowhead whaling. So they have like massive bowhead mm. rocks and the bears come and people come to photograph that actually. So there's like, I don't know, like this really weird dynamic of true coexistence. Like there is a, a dependency and I don't want to say it's like, it's not baiting. They're not baiting the bear to kill it or anything. If anything, they're baiting the bears away from their communities. <laughs> but like, um, there's a coexistence there where like, you know, bears hunt, but humans hunt and then whatever they do eat, they eat. And then to some degree, they leave a, a carcass around, like when it comes to a whale carcass, like the bones or whatever, depending on how much they want to harvest, if they harvest all of the blubber or even with seal blubber, they'll leave like, because they don't need that much. They need the meat and everything and the pelts, but they don't need that much blubber anymore. Like compared to back in the day, they will leave that fat, that, that seal fat in the pack ice so that it's a safe place, a safe stash in there for bears to go and har harvest away from a their camp or from their community so i mean it's it's different from like it's almost like a bird feeder i guess <laughs> i don't know i don't know how to such a good I, I don't know it's not really like a bear feeder but like i mean it's i don't in most instances like i feel like a lot of communities would see that as being like unethical, like don't feed the animals, don't feed the animals, but up there really nothing goes to waste, right? Things don't really decompose that fast up there. It's pretty cold. So leaving carcasses around is just asking for trouble if you're living amongst polar bears. So unless you want them in your community for tourism, but like for the most part in where I go in the high Arctic, they leave it pretty far from the community. And it's interesting to see like I think we were meant to coexist with them. It's just mm. in most places we really can't now. Our lifestyles are so different. Our how we we don't even even exist in nature anymore. You know, we go to visit nature. We don't exist in nature. We live in concrete playgrounds. And for them, like to see that coexistence is super cool. Cause I think in the high Arctic, people exist in nature. Like they actually live. And I think you probably see that in parts of 
to the world, like in Costa Rica or in Africa, Southeast Asia, in certain remote communities, you still see people existing there. And the interactions they have with wildlife is, it's not petting an animal or it's not, I don't, I don't know how to describe it. It's like, like some of them do actually keep them as pets or whatever. Like they have parrots or whatever that, you know, something has fallen out of the tree and they brought it home and it became a pet in the Amazon, like the one off parrot in the in the community or something that can't fly because it's not like there's a ton of them in the community. Uh, it's a different interaction, right? Like how they exist, I think. Like it's totally different from from baiting and from trying to get close to animals there. I feel like they live with the animals. So it's inevitable for them to get close to the animals, I think. So I think that's the difference maybe like, but to also respect that as the foreign tourists, we shouldn't have that expectation of our, it might happen, but to have that expectation when you go to these places where people do coexist with animals to have that expectation from tourism as well, you know? Yeah. I just really love that you like bring up all of these analogies. Cause the first thing that came to mind when you were just talking about like this idea of coexistence, like when something happens in Africa and I'm sure it's probably the same way in the Inuit communities that you've been in, like, you know, us in the U S and Canada, if somebody gets in conflict with an animal, it's the animal's fault. It's never the person's fault. But there's so many places like the idea of re- like just killing a lion because it, it it did something in your area or like, you know, like how many grizzly bears are killed in Yellowstone? How many of these, how many coyotes are killed because it came through your land? Like a lot of other places in the world don't see wildlife like that. It's more like, what did you do? Like, what do you mean? I'm not going to kill that hyena. Like, what are you freaking talking about? Like, that's something you would do as an American? You know, like this idea of like, I live with this wildlife. This wildlife is my neighbor. Like, this is, they have every right to be on this land as I do. Um, And I think, well, I think like, don't get me wrong. I think when it comes to polar bears, it is, that is actually an issue. Like it is, and it's getting to be more and more of an issue. And that's why there is a radar technology now for com- like being developed for communities and camps or for that purpose of trying to reduce the conflict, right? Mm-hmm. And to that, I mean, there's a lot of people that say, you know, there's indigenous communities that have seen more and more polar bears. And there's some climate denialists that are saying, you know, these communities they're seeing more polar bears why like if you guys are saying that populations are possibly in decline or will be declining well polar bears typically live on in the most inhospitable places and with climate change they're starting to be inland in communities in places where we can actually count them for one technology has gotten a lot better our accessibility to the north has gotten a lot better. So, I mean, yeah, these t- counts seem to be going up, but we also haven't had the best technology to actually count them for one. And, and it was a different world back then for polar bears. Spent a lot more time in the, on ice. We still can't even track a male b- polar bear very well, right? Like all the tracking data that we have is on female polar bears mm-hmm. because the male polar bears, like they just, their neck shape yeah they have yeah. that like slender <laughs> yeah it just right off them so um they actually developed a new like tag for that like a new oh, is it like in their ear or is it under the skin or um, they mat the fur it's it was a project with polar bears international and 3m they mm-hmm. mat the fur um and the tracking devices on like this this thing where they mat the fur and twist the hairs twist it into the fur so a it doesn't like like they're not piercing any part of their body. Yeah, it's not like super invasive. Yeah, it's not invasive. Cause like, I mean, even with the colors, like people like bears can grow out of them. So when it comes to like cubs and stuff, you don't want to put them on cubs because as they're growing, they can like, that collar could be like lethal to them. Mm-hmm. So 
when you're talking about like this little tag, it could be actually put on any bear and they just shut it out like eventually. So I think that's pretty cool. We're going to, I think in the next couple of years, start seeing some interesting data about like male bears and like baby bears, maybe. Oh, I'm always like so excited about new data. I'm just like, please, let it, you know, <laughs> like, uh, if there's any way that we can know more about these bears and, and just watch what is happening to them and what does that mean? And, you know, just the more we understand causes and the more we can help intervene. But until we actually know, know what is the cause, then it's hard to make a, a conservation plan accordingly. Well, this year, even in Churchill, like I was there for three weeks and the year before, there is a difference between weather and climate, but the year before I was there and by the end of October, everything was like, I was there end of October, everything I arrived was white and nice. Like it looked like what it, Churchill is supposed to look like at that time. And then this year I arrived October 22nd. I didn't leave till like this November 10th around there. And there was no ice. There was. I remember that. I remember you posting that because I reached out to you and I'm like, Jenny, are you, it's, it was like November, right? And I'm like, what is going on? No, like not even the snow wouldn't even stick past noon. <laughs> if there was snow, um, there was one day with hoarfrost, but I, we did a helicopter ride and there was not even like the grease ice that's usually out there. Couldn't even see that. It was pretty scary. Like a photographing polar bears with evergreen trees <laughs> like and it it did make me want to do that more often like I was just like there there's a gap in polar bear photography that doesn't really show the full story everybody wants to photograph them in snow and ice mm -hmm. and I have that urgency to want to do that because it's beautiful but there's another part of their life that is on land without snow and ice that's a summer season People don't usually gravitate towards that photography, but it's part of their life. I think it it should be told, should be told in a sense of like, you know, polar bears do exist on land. That is part of their life. The issue is the duration that this they're is on happening. Land. They're on land for. They're incredibly adapted to fasting, but the fasting period is now getting to the point where it's intolerable for them to reproduce, right? I think it's important to show that's part of their life, but with proper communication not saying you know you shouldn't see a bear with evergreen trees in Churchill that happens every year but the duration of it like I think it goes back to like sensationalizing or you know bending the truth a little bit too much right stick to the science I think and you're not going to get in trouble because I think when you you can easily pull on the heartstring of someone that is within our echo chamber but to actually reach someone beyond that you have to really stick to facts and truth and that's like science right don't like starving polar bear images that just really tug on the heartstrings you have to be super careful about your wordings about that there is degradation in overall population of polar bears body connected to the the sea ice conditions but is that polar bear that particular polar bear starving. Is that polar bear that is ultra thin representative of all polar bear population, like the polar bear population right now? It isn't. Like the really ultra thin, you know what I'm talking about. Oh, like, totally. I like, I, I'm getting that image of the one where like it's back leg is up, you know what yeah. we're talking about? And you see his yeah. hip bones and it's ribs and stuff. And yeah, like <laughs> is that polar bear representative of polar bear condition right now? Overall, it isn't, but you know what? Is the body condition of the bears deteriorating with the CS? Absolutely. That is a fact. And there is proof for that. There's data for that. But to say that that particular bear, that could be an old bear. We also have mm -hmm. to understand there's old bears, there's, you know, sick bears. <laughs> that happens to us that happens to bears and it's the same thing when we, I take a photo of a bear with an evergreen tree in November I will talk about you know the fact that this bear should not be with this evergreen tree because it's November but in the summer when I take a picture of a bear that context has to be completely different you have to be very clear about that that is a summer bear that bear just came off the ice like it 
usually does. The time when it came off, is it normal? Maybe not. Is it too early or too late? Those are things that you can talk about. But I can't say that this bear has been starving because it just got off the ice, right? Like we have to be very, I think if you want to communicate these things, you have to be very clear. You can be an alarmist, I guess, as alarming as a condition we're in. But if you want to reach people and people to take you seriously beyond our echo chamber of conservationists, you have to be very clear about those things, not stretch the truth. Could not agree with you more on that. And and the main reason why it's, I mean, people, and I don't, I don't blame greater society to be like, you've been crying wolf now for years. You told us by 2020, we would have no lions, you know, like by this point, by this point, all of our bears are going to be gone because it's going to be sea ice. And so it's very understandable that there is a lot of people that are just tuning it out. I mean, why not? I mean, I tune it out. I do. And I'm like, this is my life. And I tune this shit out. Like, what are we, what are we supposed to expect of somebody who's super, super busy in, you know, a CEO of a company that is like working like 70, 80 hours a week, you know, to build whatever it is that they are. How are we going to get to that person? And I, I think that's the next question that needs to be asked. Like, yeah, you and me can sit down until we're blue in the face and be like, oh, yes, I completely agree. But how do we get to those other people to help spread the word, you know? So it's interesting. I like read like an article about like language, mm-hmm. like, climate change, and like they showed like, you know, climate action, climate crisis, climate change, right? And there's like, I think it was Guardian that kind of always used a lot of alarmist, more alarm, like more aggressive language, like crisis, emergencies. They didn't, they just completely almost wrote off the term climate change. They just wrote like those things. Mm -hmm. They actually did like a psychological poll, like a societal thing, asked people to read things and how they felt when they read it, like especially titles. And the best response was always just actually just like the legit, like the climate change. Hmm. It made people like think a, it's a little bit more legitimate. Maybe it's just a scientific approach versus it's just people telling stories. And there was like an aspect to, I think storytelling where things can be blown out of proportion maybe uh, to pull on those heartstrings. And I don't know, like, I think I talked to you about it. It's like, there's like enough images out there kind of when it comes to storytelling. And it says, it, I mean, it sounds so bad coming from a photographer or visual media, anything, but I think we can start choosing to support organizations and putting our, using our cameras to support organizations that actually do action <laughs> instead of just tell stories. I'm sorry, we're past the time of trying to make you feel anything so that you'll do something because there's a ton of BBC documentaries and, you know, David Attenborough has done a really great job already. Like you don't need to, to just produce content anymore. Like to actually like telling stories and stuff, it's great, but like joining more organizations and pumping more funding into just storytelling is not okay. In my opinion, it's not okay. Cause we're at a point where we do need action and that action doesn't just amount to storytelling. And in some cases, inaccurate storytelling. Like you should be working with scientists, you should be working with researchers, supporting them in their mission properly. <laughs> and like working with organizations that actually like implement change for either communities or wildlife, like real change, not like band-aids where your best solution is sawing off a horn. Your mm-hmm. best solution, you know, that's, that's a great example. That's a really sad reality for an animal that that is your solution for them is that you're going to saw off their horns because ask yourself if, if you know, like you're going to mutilate yourself for your survival. Like someone's going to tell you without your choice or, you know, your buy-in say, I'm going to like chop off your hair and say that not your choice, just to chop off your hair so that you're not going to get raped or you're not going to get 
So you're going to be less attractive. I'm going to carve up your face or whatever it is so that you, so no one wants to rape you or no one wants to kill you for it. It's a very similar analogy to sawing off a rhino's horn to me. Like it's a band-aid solution and it's not really solving like their existence, like their existence in like true existence in the wild, they should be able to exist with their horns, you know, eventually. Maybe this could be a band-aid solution, but it shouldn't be the end all of solution be like, look, isn't this great? This is what we're doing and we're saving them. Are you like, imagine how much money is pumped into that industry of sawing off their horns and then calling that conservation. You can't stop there. There's no way you can stop there and say that that's, that's a solution for rhinos. Yeah. Well, I mean, and here's the thing. It's like, we all get better. Nobody's perfect. Nobody's culture is perfect. And it's important to keep an open mind, not just as we ask them to keep an open mind, but for us to keep an open mind, like we've committed genocide against like in North America, genocide against like indigenous people, like indigenous practices of like harvest, like that will change with time in how they they govern that. Can they do it better? Can Is there better technology to do it? Like we can always, to always keep an open mind on how we can improve our existence does not necessarily mean wiping out a culture or an identity. Like we can find our own ways of preserving that culture, right? And that tradition. Yeah. I feel like that was like the perfect way to tie our whole conversation around. So everyone listening absolutely needs to find you and find your work and reach out to you. And like, Jenny's amazing. Where can people find you? What's the best way to contact you? Um, social media, like almost all the platforms. My handle is jdubcatchers, so you can find me there. Instagram, I'm probably the most active on Instagram, though. Yeah, and you'll see why. When <laughs> anyone gets on, just follows, of course. It's like, her Instagram is beautiful. It's <laughs> spectacular. It's a spectacular <laughs> Instagram. So, well, Ginny, thank you so much for coming on, and I cannot wait to get this out to the world. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It was such a pleasure. Hey, thanks again for listening to this episode of Rewildology. If you like what you heard, hit that subscribe button to never miss a future episode. Do you have a cool environmental organization, travel story, or research that you'd like to share? Let me know at rewildology.com. Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet.